All right. Hey, is that all right? You can actually see it. Amazing. All right. So now we can actually do some stuff. All right. Let's see. So first of all, we'll try FinViz and we'll take a look at the chart. Commercials. I want to have ad blocker. See, this is awful. You I would hate to use a computer without ad blocker. <laughs> oh my god. That doesn't happen to me. That's so funny. It's like things don't pop up. Oh god, I would never go to this site. Are you kidding? I don't see any of those things on here. All right, so where are we? Indices. All right, so what do we got here? Here's the here's the gist of the chart. Dow's down 27, S and P. Oh, that's fun. I didn't know you could do that. Nasdaq, Russell, Nikkei. Wow, look at the Nikkei. It's really flatlining 16.5. I hope that's big enough for you guys. Probably not. Um, DAX. DAX got rejected at 10.5. Euro stocks rejected at 3,000. That's important. Here's the oil. You know, you notice everybody. Look, see. Ah, uh, uh, all right. Let's get to the actual stuff. No freaking way! Wow. Fifty-five <laughs> percent on the other one. Holy cow! Every time. All right. Anyway, so this is the daily chart. So you see on the dailies. We're all doing what we in the chart world call a triangle squeezy thingy. The triangle squeezy thingy is where your highs and lows start getting into a channel where you can draw a triangle from, up, from all the highs to all the lows, and they come into a point. And when you get to that point, which is basically right where we are now, you're at a huge market inflection. And, and it doesn't really tell you whether it's going to go up or down. But it does tell you that something drastic is likely to happen very shortly. And you're seeing it here on all the indexes. You can, you, know, you can draw this line, and you can see it squeezing into a little wedge. Maybe if we have a bigger chart, we'll see something. I don't know if we'll draw this. Let's see. Whoa, jeez. And of course, more ads. Wow, oh, it's unbearable. No, it doesn't. But look, you see how it is right there? See that line is so easy to see, and here it's like a complete little triangle, so it's going to pop. So if we want to find clues, what do we do? Well, we go to Phil Stock World, of course. Let's see. Philadelphia oh. Eagles, how dare you? No, come on. How many words do I have to put? All right, so we take a look here, and I'm sure Jean-Luc did the big chart today. We can get it bigger. No. Okay. Anyway, so here's the thing. Mm, I really got to make this bigger. I have no idea how. Ooh. Hang on a second. I bet one of you guys know how to make the picture bigger on the Apple. Um, where are you here? Okay. So, does anyone know how to make a picture bigger on the Apple? Can anybody hear me? <laughs> Am I talking to myself? I don't think I am afraid with a cold when you think. Oh. <laughs> no Apple people, huh? Poor Apple. They still don't have that market share in computers. All right, well, reason number one. I tell you, the main reason I don't use this Apple is because I don't know how to click on it. That's the problem. I know if, I, if it was uh, Windows, I could right click and make a new tab. Oh, wait, command. Command click. No. Option click. No. Control click. Ooh, 
Hope and image in your, in your tip. Do it. No, still didn't help. <laughs> At least I know what to do, though. Nope, can't make it bigger. All right. <sighs> so annoying not to have my computer. Anyway, so given that we know it's a triangle squeezy thing, right? We know that. So then what you want to do is look at what's going to happen. So we don't really, you know, the thing you care about most is the NYSE, which is over here, and the S&P. Those are the two most important indexes because they have the, these have the biggest stocks and these have the most stocks. So here's the problem. You don't know which way you your your you don't know which way the uh, index is going to shoot out of this spot, right? But what do we know? We know the 50-day moving average in both cases. The 50-day moving average is not only above it; uh, it's above your inflection point. So it's not only above it, but it's also falling. See, falling just a little bit, falling and falling because we're uh, uh, and why is it falling? Because look, we're spending time below. When you're below the 50-day moving average, it's like you're pulling this bar down. You're pulling the line down because you're below it. If you're above it, you're pulling it up. If you're below it, you're pulling it down. The weight of being below the 50-day moving average for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 12, 12, 12, for like 20 days. So for 40% of the time on the 50-day moving average now, we've been basically below it. Not by much. The more you're below it, the more you're pulling it. But we're pulling it down. So we're, we're, we're squeezing and hitting an inflection point like in a week or so, and we're going to hit the inflection point right into the declining 50-day moving average. That means it's going to be very, very hard for us to break up on a, technical, on a technical standpoint. And also, though, that just kind of confirms the fact that we know that we're way too, uh, you know, on a valuation standpoint, we're too high also. All right, so that does not bode well. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so that's what we get from that. But that's, you know, that's the, the only, you know, that's what you can use technicals for because you can see what's going to happen kind of. Um, but I, this is the thing. I don't look at technicals backwards. I look at technicals forwards because I get, I get a lot more information by figuring out what's going to happen. So let's look at all the indexes again. Oh, my God, every time. So, um, so we're seeing the same kind of action in all of them. That's very disturbing, number one. Energy, is, even energy is also, we've got squeezes in energy too coming up. Oh, these guys are really, look at, look at how, look at this, this is the month of September. See how you're, you're squeezing into this little kind of zone and something's got to give. So this line is this line's flat, and then you've got the big line coming down. And apparently, forty-seven fifty is the number on Brent, and fit and forty-five fifty is where we are on a on a WTI. And then we've got bonds are probably bond, actually the bonds are kind of they they they, they look like they're bottoming, but that's only because of this Fed ceiling. If I don't believe that at all. How are the metals looking? No, see, even the metals are kind of uh, gyrating around. And how, how's the coffee doing? Sugar, orange is flying. Coffee doing very well since we called it down. Hmm, I forget when we called coffee. I think it was like I think it's like down here, just low 150. I wanted to get it when it broke up. I don't remember anymore, frankly. Oh, no, oh, I'm sorry. No, that's not true. We caught it down here at 140 in August. That's right. I made that call in August, and we caught, we caught the nice bottom there. But I, reiter I reiterated that over 150, I still like it, and we're going to like it all the way up to, like, um, well, let's get a bigger picture. So you got to put coffee in perspective. <laughs> you see coffee has had a rough, you know, a decade, basically. Um, there was a burst of coffee craze that went on here, then it kind of died out. People are still consuming a lot of coffee, but what happens is the growth of the coffee, you know, because everybody's drinking coffee like crazy, see when Starbucks and everything, and then there's was, there was like five other coffee, there's Pete's coffee for a while, there's some other coffee, GMCR started making the machine, GMCR, is that right? Green Mountain Coffee, yeah, that's right. So Green Mountain Coffee started doing the machine. Um, 
you know, those carry things. So all these different people started putting out coffee machines. Now imagine the demand of for coffee when you've got three or four different companies that are pumping coffee into these little cups and filling warehouses full of cups of granulated coffee that they that they've stored. Okay, so and it was last year there were no warehouses filled with coffee, uh, those mini coffee, what do you call them, coffee shop things, whatever they are. So those little coffee things that go in the machine. So last year there were no warehouses filled with those. This year, there are warehouses filled with those. So you think about that and you think, well, geez, how much coffee acreage are we shoving into warehouses? That's what creates that demand. All right? So it's not going to last. And the same thing happens with almost any commodity, right? That happened with copper, too. China went crazy stockpiling copper because they were building cities. They were building entire cities, and they constantly needed copper. So they got tired of running out of copper. So they said, let's just buy all the copper in the world. That was actually their plan. They're like, let's just buy all the copper in the world and put it in a couple of warehouses so we've got at least a year or two supply. And so for about two years, they were buying copper and buying copper and buying copper like crazy. Um, but then what happens when they start? Now, when you buy copper or you buy coffee, what happens? The demand for coffee and copper goes up, right? So at first, there's not enough. But then at the price that coffee is selling at, I wish this chart, oh, the chart does go longer if you go to monthly, so I'll show you. Uh, here's a monthly view. Very slow. Here it comes with more ads, I bet. Ooh, we got away with this. <laughs> All right. So here's coffee chugging along this, at this nice normalized price. Then all of a sudden, a bunch of demand for coffee. Starbucks is growing. Peep coffee comes online. People start putting coffee in little containers and blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, demand is up huge. So for this part of the time, there, the coffee industry is caught unaware. This year also, another great year for coffee, right? This year, though, or actually, I'm sorry, during this time this year probably, they start planting a shit ton of coffee because people who wouldn't plant coffee at 225 at 325, start going, hey, I'm going into the coffee business. All right? And like I said, it's the same for copper. It's the same for anything. This is how commodities work. When the demand goes up, it, and oil, it goes like that for oil too, frankly. <clears throat> when the price goes up, then everybody says, oh, I can justify this project. I can justify this project. I can raise money. Everybody wants to put money into coffee growing businesses. Everyone wants to buy a plantation, so on and so forth. So all of a sudden, there's this huge boom in coffee. But then what happens? Then a year later, everybody's producing coffee. And, and suddenly demand stops growing. You can't have, that everybody over extrapolates everything. You can't have infinite demand. And especially if you understand why the demand went up. China copper warehouses, you know, we shorted copper because this would be great like a, a couple of years ago. Because if you understand why the demand went up, like, in fact, oil, one of the reasons oil was up this summer, not that it was up much, but China was warehousing oil also. China's building strategic petroleum reserves of their own. We have one. And China is slowly but surely building new reserves for themselves. Every time they build a new reserve that holds another 100 million barrels of oil, they have to buy 100 million barrels of oil and stick it in the ground. It's not real demand. They're buying it to stick it in the ground. But it causes, obviously, that it causes global demand, and people think falsely that there's a huge demand for China, in China for oil. But it's not real demand. It's not sustainable. So the coffee demand wasn't sustainable. So then too many people are growing coffee and we crash. But then what happens when we crash? There's a certain level that you crash. Now we did this with gold. Mm -hmm. uh, da, 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 metal. So we went through this the opposite way with gold because with gold, God, this is slow. Sorry, I'm so used to my supercomputer. I can't take this thing. Um, so when gold was bottoming, are you kidding me? 91% on my good computer. Wow. I would have gotten rid of this computer years ago if I could do this kind of stuff with it. Um, where was it? Oh, yeah. So when gold was bottoming, and we were early with that quote, but basically when it got down to about $1,100 an ounce, I, I ran the numbers, and I was banging the table on gold. My logic was, I said, look, it cost $1,000 to pull gold out of the ground. 
And that, that's, that's for, for good operators. Some people pay a lot more than that. But, but the baseline is that you really can't pull gold out of the ground for less than a thousand bucks. Therefore, a thousand dollars is the floor. That's just logic. Now, oil is the same thing. Oil costs a certain amount to, to pull out of the ground. But once you have an operation, and this is why these things get illogically low and illogically high. Once you have an operation, so if I have an oil well, and I've got 80 people working my oil well, and I've got a lease on my equipment and all this crap, and I'm paying my rent, and I've got insurance, and so on and so forth. So I've got this whole little mini city drilling oil, right? And I'm, and I'm producing, uh, let's say, so let's say my cost of, of, of running my well is $50,000 a month, including all the people and whatever. So I'm paying 50000 bucks a month to run an oil well with my crew. Now, oil is usually 70 bucks a barrel, and I get seventy thousand. Keep it simple. So seventy dollars, I get seventy thousand dollars, right? So I'm making twenty thousand a month. So fine, I'm making twenty thousand a month. It's a great little business. It costs me fifty thousand a month. Um, now oil goes down to sixty, and I'm making ten thousand a month. Still not a problem. I don't worry about it. Oil goes to fifty, and I'm break even, right? Now I'm collecting fifty thousand a month, and I'm spending fifty thousand a month. It's break even. Now. We've all had businesses, well, not all of us, but if you've had a business that's running at break even, you keep running the business at break even. You try to improve it. You try to find ways to cut a little here, cut a little there, figure something out. Um, you know, just to, 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 to scratch out a little extra money if you can. That's fine. So then oil goes to 45. Now I'm losing 5,000 a month. Am I going to shut my well down? Well, no, because if I lay everybody off, and I shut the well down. I still got to pay my taxes. I still got to pay for the land. I still got to pay for the equipment. I probably have like leases on the equipment. I can't send it back. Um, uh, I, I still got to cover my own nut. Uh, well, I, I feel bad about laying off all my staff and so on and so forth. So unless I think there's going to be a, a huge sustainable loss, it's going to take me a long time to capitulate at 45, right? I'm going to still pump oil. Even though it seems illogical, I'm still going to pump oil or I'm still going to mine gold. Okay? Just because you go below the break-even point doesn't mean people are going to stop. It takes a long time for it to wash through. That's where we are with oil. Okay? It, it took, because of the low interest rates, all the money that the oil producers have been borrowing, all their debt is at incredibly low financing rates. So the oil companies have the ability to sustain a very prolonged downturn, okay? Because look, if I, I had a business, remember, if my oil at 70, I was making 20,000 a month. Now it's at 45, I'm losing 5,000 a month. So I say to my banking friend, and I go, hey buddy, um, I need 50,000 bucks to get through the next year. Say I was 60,000, losing 5,000 a month. I need $60,000 to get through the next year so I can break even. And he's like, well, he, he goes, well, looking at your past record, you make 60000 bucks every, every quarter. And I'm like, yeah, so all we've got to do is wait for oil to come back to 70. It'll be great. So he'll lend me some money, right? Um, unless he believes there's going to be a sustained downturn, I won't be able to pay him back. But that's unlikely. Plus, I do have assets that I can borrow against, right? So I leverage up my debt. But my, but my debt burden, if I borrow $50,000, I'm paying 5% interest. My, my debt burden on the, on the $50,000 is only uh, 2500 for the year. So that's nothing. I don't mind paying that interest to, to have $50,000 or $60,000 to go through. So I'm going to keep producing oil for a year. And next year, well, I'm not gonna, if I shut now, next year, if oil is still 45 or even if it's 40, I'm not going to shut down because now if I shut down, I've got to pay this guy back 60000 bucks, and I've got no business. So I'm either going to sell, and we see a lot of that going on, right? You see a lot of M&A and a lot of acquisitions, because I'm either going to sell my business because I don't see it, I don't, I'm worried there may not be an end in sight, or I'm going to just keep going. I'm going to borrow more and leverage up and hope for the best and hope at some point somebody blows up a pipeline somewhere like happened today and the price of oil shoots back up. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to pray, or I'm, I don't have to actually pray for, for a rebel attack. I can go fund a rebel attack by wiring $100,000 to a few Nigerian guys. You know, that's how you, that's how you blow up. You want to blow up a, well, no, that's not a good thing to say. <laughs> Theoretically, if somebody wanted to blow up a pipeline. Okay, sorry, Homeland Security. <laughs> but that's how easy it is. I mean, honestly, if you know who to contact, 
um, you can pretty much get anything you want blown up in Africa. So that's that's what that's why we call it rent a rebel when that sort of thing happens. Is it's always the timing is so exquisite. You can't imagine that a bunch of random Nigerian teenagers are are timing their their attacks uh, to coincide with the uh, inventory report, right? <laughs> it's like, oh, the inventory report wasn't good today. We, we had a bad inventory report today. Oh, something blew up. Now it's all fixed. Everything's better. It's insane. So. So anyway, so another thing you do obviously when business is bad is you cut costs. So what happened? ABX, Barrett Gold, when gold was going down, ABX went on this cost cutting mission. And they did a couple of things. They sold off their less they sold off their high cost mines. So any month, so in other words, you have an average cost in, in your operation and maybe their average was ten fifty to pull gold out of the ground across all their mines. But that means some were nine, some were eight, and some were twelve, right? Every mine that was twelve dollars, they sold. So Barrett Gold sold every mine that wasn't uh, like below ten. They they got rid of it. Um, they also cut costs and did a whole bunch of other things. They also did something smart. They sold off everything in Africa. They said we're out of Africa. Forget it. You know why? It's easy to run the business. Africa is a pain in the ass. Okay, so one of the, it, it wasn't the best cost region. It's a pain in the ass to get down there, and. Um, and they ha and and because obviously if I'm the manager if I'm the CEO of, of ABX and I've got to be in um, Canada all the time I've got American operations all the time I've got South American operations all the time going to Africa is is out of my way and going to Australia is out of my way so they got rid of those operations now my plane flight time and my staff's plane flight time is cut down so they did all the right things to consolidate their operation and they dropped the cost of their ma of their manufacturing to like eight fifty nine hundred dollars an ounce. So that's why I love ABX because ABX now they make a fortune. Even if gold is twelve hundred bucks, they're still making great money. Even at eleven hundred dollars, they're going to make money now. They've made themselves practically bulletproof. Now it's not completely bulletproof because you look at their profits. Their profits are if we're at thirteen hundred now and their cost is nine hundred, so their profits are four hundred, right? But if oil goes back to eleven hundred, what happens? Well, fifty percent of their profits disappear. Because no one, you know, you don't care about the cost of gold. You care about the margin of the of the money that it costs them to pull the gold versus their profits. That's what matters. All right. And on that note, I'm going to go back to my main computer. So I think I'm going to have to leave this meeting, and we're going to hope for the best. Okay. So give me about uh, oh, just give me a few minutes to get out, and we'll see what happens. But oh, damn it. Hang on, because I'm going to lose all these questions. I just want to make sure there's no serious questions we need to talk about. Okay, great. I will. Right, so, we, so when I when I log back in, if you have a question, then then ask it. And hopefully, it's going to work. So I'm going to just quit this. I think that's for the best. I'm going to shut this down, and then we'll start on the other computer.
and I'm back. <laughs> what a freaking hassle. Now when I came back in, it said uh, it started telling me stuff. Like it, it, the computer looked like it was ready, but then as soon as I hit it, it starts telling me things like, we did this to your protection, blah, blah, blah. You know, we are a safe and secure company, and thank Microsoft for keeping an eye on your crap. Um, very annoying. All right, so sorry about all that. All right, where are we now? So now we're ready to actually go. Now I've got my proper screens and we can do a good webinar. Can anybody hear me? Yay! All right. Um, screen sharing. Uh-oh. Where's my screen sharing app? Now this thing's asking me to update Java. <laughs> I gotta tell you, they talk about AI and all that old stuff. Everything's like all this amazing stuff, and meanwhile, they can't just get a computer to just work. They get an iPad to just work. I that my iPad's amazing. That thing just works. You pick it up, it works. It updates itself. It does everything itself. It never has a problem. It doesn't break. It doesn't crash. But you know why? It's because Apple has fanatical control of the uh, company. They, 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 you know, they've got a watchdog on everything. And I guess probably they should do that with computers. All right. Are we all good? Can you see me now? Can you see me now? Fantastic. <sighs> all right. Very stressful getting all the stuff working right. <clears throat> so where are we? Oh, a little bit of an uptick. Okay. Much bigger. I like that. Um, everything, everything's going up, and the dollar is going down a bit. So the dollar dropped from 95.60 to 95.44, and right when it started dropping, things started picking up. I imagine somebody said something, and wasn't that... Oh, it's Evans. We knew Evans was going to be dubbish. See, we could have played that. Damn it. Because we, we knew Evans was going to be dovish. He's a dove. That's his job. He comes in and says dovish things. After, notice, after the seven-year note auction, they had him scheduled at 1.30 because you don't want to say anything dovish before the auction because you still want people, to, you want people to buy those bonds for 0%. But um, after the auction, sure, then you can talk up the markets because there's no more, there's no more notes to sell for a couple of weeks. So now we can drift higher into the end of the month, which is very likely to happen. Get back to old, good old FinViz here. See, no ads. Beautiful. Um, we'll check out our indexes. I mean, I'm sure if I learned how to use the Apple properly, I could use it like a pro, but I just compared to the way I know how to use this thing, it doesn't make any sense. My little job is ready to be installed. How fantastic. Go away. Later. All right. <clears throat> So where were we? All right. What were we talking about today? That's a good question. So back at the old stock world, that's right, we had plenty of stuff to talk about today. We were talking about uh, natural gas, which is still, by the way, as it pulls back, as it comes back into this channel, this is a, this is a bullish triangle squeezy thingy. Um, let's see if we can find that. UNG, UNG. Oh, I've got to pull this chart up. Hang on. Opening new tab. See how I know how to do everything on this? No problem. All right. You see, you have this. This. This is the. This is the ascending wedge. Here's the. Uh, the highs. But you see, you're making kind of like higher highs and higher lows. So that's generally bullish. And even if we're squeezing into this, we're probably going to squeeze and pop up. And also, then if you look at um, this, here's your 50. is 50. This is the simplified moving average. But it's the same thing. Here's your 50-day moving average. It's going up. So when you hit it, when you're squeezing. You're coming into an uptrending 50-day moving average. That means you're much more likely to keep going up and pop. And that's really what those guys said today. I forget who it was. Um, no, that one. Who was it? Uh, Saxo. So Saxo's report, which uh, somebody pointed out yesterday. So thanks for that. So this breakout model going along, and so so they are look, they are looking at it technically and saying this is an up this is an uptrending breakout, and and you can see on this chart too it's consolidating, 
or move up. And you guys know that with the 5% rule. Oh, I'm sure this is hard to see. Let's see if we can make that bigger. Fantastic. Um, so, consolidation at 2, a move to 3. All right, so the 5 to 10 rule says what? You go up a dollar, your retrace, a weak retrace is going to be 20 cents to 280, and a strong retrace is going to be 40 cents to 260, which is right about here. See how it consolidates at that 260 line? So it held, and, and by the way, and again, you can't take it so literally, okay? It generally held, just like this is, this is consolidation at 2. The fact that it went below it doesn't invalidate the line. It's, it's, cons it's around there. Because within any given day, there's all kinds of factors. Maybe the whole market went down. Maybe something particularly happened. Maybe there was news. You can't go by what happens in one or two days. You have to look at the broader picture when you're trying to figure out where consolidations are. But clearly, April and May, we consolidated around two. In fact, frankly, March, you're, you're doing a breakout consolidation. Then you fly up. Now, when you fly up like this, you have to expect to retrace. It, when you're up 50%, you have to expect to retrace. So the retrace is 20% of the run up to here, or a strong retrace, 40% of the run, which is around here. And then what do we do? We come back, and now we're testing the top again. This is a bullish consolidation that's probably going to lead to a breakout. So there's, there's two ways to look at that from a charting perspective. Now, again, we think it's going to break out because, as we were just saying with our little talk on coffee, so wait, let's see what else these guys say. Uh, these guys, I think, are pretty much uh, injections, come below seasonal average. Okay. Due to strong weather-related demand. Interesting. Okay. <clears throat> so, when they say injections are below average, that's bullshit because the, the, the amount below average is so minute that it makes no difference. Um, but the weather-related demand. So, no, it's going to get cold, and people are going to turn on their, their gas. In fact, it was. It was like 45 degrees out um, last, a couple of nights ago, and I actually was considering putting on my fireplace. I have a gas fireplace. So, um, and, 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 and we turned off, I, we, just this week, we turned off our AC. I live in New Jersey. We turned off the AC, so we don't need it anymore. And um, we turned off, well, we didn't turn on the heat, but we put it up to uh, 70 or whatever the heck it is. So uh, we are now in winter mode. So our house has been changed over to winter mode already. Um, and if it gets, you know, if it gets chillier, I, 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 li I just like the way it looks. I mean, I like to put the fireplace on whenever, whenever I have an excuse to put the fireplace on, I like to put the fireplace on, frankly. But I guess that's happening everywhere. So it is now heating season, and we can expect natural gas to slowly but surely start drawing down. As a bonus, though, when you're playing natural gas, the reason you have some natural gas plays, it's also hurricane season. And if you get a good hurricane, you <laughs> good hurricane from that perspective. But if you get a good hurricane that shuts down the gas production in the Gulf of Mexico, then you can get a huge spike in natural gas. So it's fun to be long when you have a good spot to be long. So above the three dollar line, you can play long, but you have to keep very tight stops on that. Um, they're talking about their stops and changing it, blah blah blah. Weekly inventory injections picking up ahead of the uh, headwind for withdrawals early in November. Risk of long liquidation from hedge funds having increased bullish bets on a two-year high. Um, yeah, like us, like we got. Well, we we took our money in in July. I think, frankly, <clears throat> I think everybody did. I think us and a bunch of hedge funds took our money and ran in July. This is like the very first day of July or whatever. I remember we hit three dollars. I was like, you take the money at three dollars. Who the hell stays in after you make fifty percent in a couple of months? Um, and it wasn't 50% because we had futures contracts. So we were up massive on our futures contracts. So we, we, you know, we were done with the play, but we still kept our longs because in the, in the bigger picture, oh, I love these guys. See, they have nice, they, they, they do exactly what, these guys do exactly what I do. They, they look at the bigger charts. You've got, you always go from a short-term chart to a long-term chart to confirm what you're talking about. Here's their $3 line. So we've been, we were above, now look how these even out. We were above the volume above, see the volume above the space is the volume above the $3 line. Now we're below the $3 line with similar volume. So we spent as much time above as below. It's a good case for saying the $3 line makes sense. Now, we'll probably go back above. If we break out above, we could have a very nice run. I would say at least halfway of this run. Now, this run, what is that? That's uh, 
three, three fifty. Here's four, and here's five. So I would say four dollars is very much in the cards. And that's our target, frankly. And not because that's our target, but again, it goes back to because of what I was talking about. Because um, natural gas, it's the same thing as coffee. It's the same thing as anything else. They had a big boom. Everybody was making natural gas. There was a bunch of M&A consolidation around here when Chevron bought um, Conoco and things like that. Big consolidation plays, lots of natural gas. Chesapeake was opening up shale and so on and so forth. And everybody thought it was like natural gas is the future. And they're right, though, because coal is dead and natural gas is the future. But boom, 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 too many people started producing it. And honestly, there's only so much natural gas we can use at the moment. And down we went. And now it's coming back. And they've got, you know, we're going to start increasing demand because we're going to have, like, some natural gas parts. Uh, electric doesn't work for trucks, but natural gas does. So they're going to start converting more and more trucks to natural gas. That's going to be an unprecedented use. And the biggest deal, of course, and the reason we started buying down here is because we're exporting natural gas. These guys don't even talk about that. And to me, that's the number one fundamental on natural gas is we're exporting it. And as I mentioned in today's post, well, hmm, did we see it to that? Where was I? Do I have that PowerPoint? No, I don't have the actual PowerPoint. That's the problem. I mean, I do on my, on my other computer I have it because I, cause I made the PowerPoint. Um, but not to get too into it. But we had, I had a whole big thing. Oh, wait. I bet it's here. Oh, yeah. Here you go. That is a LNG. That's the company, LNG. That's a natural, liquefied natural gas. That is a shipment of liquefied natural gas. Now, <clears throat> this container is pressurized. It holds 600 times more gas by volume. So when you pressurize and liquefy the natural gas, it holds 600. So 600 of these ships filled with actual natural gas can be condensed into this one ship when you liquefy the natural gas. That's why we're now able to export it, okay, profitably. So we export it. We're just, this is all just starting. We're still in the very early stages. But that's why inevitably, as we export more natural gas, the price of this is, this is the company, LNG. But as we export more natural gas, these guys make more money. They add more ships and more terminals. They make more money. And eventually, we export a ton of natural gas. Now, what's going to happen? We're going to export too much natural gas. And, other, and we're not the only country exporting natural gas. <laughs> That's the funniest thing. If you pay attention, everywhere in the world where they produce natural gas, the problem with natural gas has always been landlocked, right? So it was never profitable to ship it because, it, obviously, you didn't have that 600 times compression. So it wouldn't make sense to send 600 ships full of natural gas to collect the same money that this one ship collects. So what they have is these natural gas processing plants <clears throat> that take the natural gas, they cool it, and they put it into these containers. It's a, uh, a big process, though. It's not fast, and it can't be done easily. So they have to spend $5 billion or whatever to build these terminals that make it all happen, storage facility terminals. You have to keep the gas away from people because, God forbid, it ever blows up. It's like a nuclear bomb going off. Um, so there's you know, all, these, all these rules for it also as far as, as far as the logistics. But still, it's inevitable because it's so profitable, and it needs to be done because there are places that have no natural gas that desperately need it, and they have to construct these really convoluted, long pipelines and maintain the pipeline, so on and so forth. Whereas a place like the U.S., we have so much natural gas. If you ever go by an oil field, um, you see these fires off the wells, right? These wells, they have constant fires off the wells. They're burning off excess natural gas. It's a freaking waste product. Natural gas is a waste product of oil drilling. We have so much of it that we burn it. We just burn it to, to get rid of it. We don't know what to do with the freaking stuff. So bottling it up and sending it overseas to somebody who needs it is a fantastic idea. In Asia, they pay nine bucks for natural gas. In Europe, they pay six bucks for natural gas because they don't have it the way we have it. We, pay, we, we were paying two. Now we're paying three. Why are we paying three? Because we're sending it away. We're sending our excess gas away. But that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's fine to pay a reasonable price for it. So the drift up is going to be to four. Asia is going to come down. Everyone's going to come down. Asia's price will come down, and they'll pay four plus shipping. Europe will pay four plus shipping. All right, but Europe shipping, Europe will pay less because they've got, uh, they can have Russian natural gas. They can have Middle East natural gas. They can have U.S. natural gas. Asia, 
is further, so it's more expensive to ship to them, they'll always pay the most. Um, and also the mainland China, so on and so forth. So, oh, actually China, though, they're opening up their own supplies. They're, they're, they've got um, all sorts of drilling going on and so on. So anyway, the bottom line is, so what's going to happen? Eventually, you reach the sort of equilibrium point in between the price that we have and the price that everybody else pays. Um, so we see natural gas fundamentally, for those fundamental reasons, we see natural gas moving up to four. The charts confirm what we thought was going to happen. Okay? The trick is, though, that we thought it was going to happen when it was down here, when the chart did not look so pretty. We, were, we picked it when it was down here. That's the difference between being a fundamental investor and a TA person, because the TA people were selling, and they were predicting natural gas, not, not LNG again. Sorry, keep looking at the LNG chart. Where's the natural gas? What? Oh, that's not today. That's why. Sorry. This isn't today's post. Anyway, this is the post where I explain everything in my logic. Uh, back in February, see 225? And when does gas bottom out? This is 225. This is when I wrote this article. But we had already called it down here. I, I was banging the table on this on February uh, 10th. There you go. February 10th money talk. That's when I was on this uh, TV show. So you can click on that and see the whole TV show where we're talking about why natural gas is the greatest play to make. So, let me again find that natural gas. So here we are. So the trick is when the chart looks like this, to know you should be buying. That's fundamental trading. It, it, you can, people tell you, oh my God, I wouldn't buy on this chart. It looks ugly. And here everybody's like, oh my God, we should get out, we should capitulate. And it's like, no, no, we like it. And up it goes. So this is this is um, this is going to go all the way up to here. This is still got a long way to go, and it's like I said, it's ten thousand a contract. But you've got to look at your channel because the channel we're in now, even if you assume that we're going to stay in this rising wedge, you can still go back to two eighty five very easily. So at two eighty five, two eighty, we would love to buy it if it tests the bottom of this channel. I'd love to get back in on the longs here because I, I think we can easily pop over this 320. And from 280 to 320 is four. That it's a, basically every every 10 cents is is a thousand dollars. So if we get from 280 to 320, that's four thousand dollars per contract of a move. And, and if you want to hang on for the whole run all the way to four to four dollars, you're talking about ten thousand per contract, which is the same as we made coming in at two and, and getting out of three. So there's still plenty of money to be made here, and I, I put up this trade. Where, oh, I thought I put up a trade. Oh, here. To continue with LNG, the company that's benefiting from all this stuff. Okay, so on LNG, the trade was buy 10 long, buy 10 LNG, 2018, 32.54. Now, look where the stock is. The stock is at 42.50. I'm buying the 32.50 calls. And those are 1360. We sell the $45 calls. That's right here. Doesn't seem like it's out of reach, right? To give, we're going to give them. We're going to give them 13, 14. I'm sorry, 15 months to get there. So 15 months to get there. And we sell the 45 calls to 680. So some idiot is paying 680 for the 45 calls. We're buying the calls with their $10 in the money for 13 bucks. So he's, he's paying all of our premium plus another three bucks. So that cuts our net cost on this. We're at about 720. So we're at so, so net for us, since we have the thirty dollar calls, I'm sorry, 3250 calls, and we're paying net 720, we're right about at 3920. Our entry price is here. We've actually given ourselves a discount for the current price. And then we're selling. The, um, the 2018 3750 puts. And 3750 puts are way down here. So we're saying we think this line is solid and it's going to hold. And, we, and, it, and all we have to do, since we're netting into this trade for 1550, the spread is a 1250 spread on 10 contracts is $12,500. So your upside is $11,300 on that trade. That's using the company LNG Chenier Energy. 
Now, we can do a natural gas trade too, but I'm waiting for it to come back down. If hurricane season is disappointing, we could even get, you know, the, here's a 260 line, so we could actually revisit 260. Maybe worse if people start panicking and freaking out. Look what happened last year. Okay, so here we are in September. Look familiar, right? So here we are in September and holding up, but then what happened in October? Down and down and down. So, you know, we're not racing to buy natural gas here, but LNG is a long-term story. I like them, you know, it's a little more, a little safer way to play it, put it that way. All right, so questions. <clears throat> Any thoughts on CHRW? Uh, not really. Should I have CHRW? What are they doing today? They're advertising, right? Is that what they are? Not a stock I really pay attention to. Oh, logistics. So they're advertising. <laughs> so definitely no thought on them. I thought there was somebody else. I mean, that's a, it's a good business. I don't know them in particular. I don't. We don't follow them. Um, they're a big company too. It's funny. I never really pay attention to them. Um, no, but if you ask me in chat, I, if you remind me on the weekend, I can probably take a look. But it's not a company I pay any attention to at all. In fact, I thought they were I thought they were an advertising agency. So. <laughs> they hold up a, me, uh, a measly quarter point because of the dollar. Look, the Fed, you know, look, there's a myth that the Fed cares about anything. They don't care about anything but whether the banks are, are doing well or not. Okay, they're doing all the, the Fed is an organization of bankers. They, everybody in the Fed was appointed by the bankers. Obama, or the president, whoever, gets to appoint one of the bankers to be the chairman of the Federal Reserve. He doesn't get to pick anyone he wants. Okay? They, get, they say, here are the potential candidates to be the chairman of the Federal Reserve. They've already picked them. They've already been picked by the banks. Jamie Dimon tells you who the chairman of the Fed is, not the president of the United States. Okay, Lloyd Blankfein and Jamie Dimon and a couple of other bankers say, this is who, <laughs> John Stump, and our friend John Stump from Wells Fargo, right? Um, they're all sitting board council members at, at, at the Fed. They run the Fed. The board of governors, it's like, you know what it's like? It's like a board of directors, right? So the, chair, so the Fed is like a, the, the Fed chairman are like a board of directors of, for the bankers, but they don't really run the bank. The banks run themselves, and then they, they have a board, and the point of the Fed is it's sort of to, um, it's, like a, it's like a council of crime lords, right? Like it, each bank has their own people, and they've got their insiders, but they all have a seat at the council table, and they make decisions to set rates. So the banks, this is what they do. They make a decision to set the rate so the banks don't compete with each other and don't accidentally start getting into rate wars. Okay, you know how like they used to give you a toaster or something like that. Like if you open an account, those are, those are rate wars. That's they're, they're they're competing to get your to get people's business. They don't want that. They don't want banks competing to get business. That's why they went on this program to wipe out all these smaller banks. They they got rid of all these local banks because the local banks would give you a toaster to open an account or something like that. And the big banks don't want to give you a toaster. They only want to give you interest. They just want your money. And that's what the Fed is doing. The Fed, is set, the Fed has gotten so good at setting rates that they are now saying, this is a cartel of bankers, and they are now saying to you, give us your money, and we'll get to play with it and make money using your money, but we won't give any to you. In fact, we're going to charge you to lend us money. We're going to, you know, we're going to... Because they're not protecting your money. This is another asinine thing, right? Your money doesn't need protecting. This is where the Bitcoin people are right. Your money doesn't need protecting by a bank. Because there's no money. You hand them a piece of paper that says you've got money from your, your, your company, gives you money, 
in a paycheck, right? You, it's not money. Those piece of paper says you have money. You give that piece of paper to the bank, and the bank takes the piece of paper and they put it in your account. There's no money. Money is a complete fallacy. Money is a made-up concept at this point. It doesn't, it's completely meaningless. But so, so to hold your electronic balance, <laughs> they're not protecting it. There's no vault. Nobody's guarding it. I say you have to have security uh, on the on the cyber accounts and things to make sure other people don't uh, use your balances. But that that can be done again. That that's done better by Bitcoin generally. Um, it really is ridiculous, you know, when you think about it. <laughs> so for that, in order to do that, if you give them if you give them an account with six figures on it, they will they they are literally telling you we're going to take some of that money. When, they, when you go down to negative rates, they're literally telling you, and we're going to charge you fees for keeping your money. It's freaking insane. We're morons, though. We, the people, are idiots for agreeing to this system. Where's the logic to it? Why? You know, back in the old days, when people, when, when people used to rob you, when guys used to walk, you know, guys used to run around with guns, well, they still run around with guns, unfortunately. When people used to run around with guns and just sort of, like, rob people in the streets, and people used to rob, you know, go to businesses and rob them, and whatever. So what happened? People started putting money in the banks to keep it safe. And what was the function of a bank? Well, the bank would hire guards, and the bank would have a fault. And in theory, it was hard to, run, to steal your money from a bank. So you would keep your money in the bank. And the bank would then, that, that's how it all began. And the bank would then start using your money. They're like, well, why don't we have your money sitting around? We're going to lend it to other people and charge interest. But they used to physically lend money. You know, in, 1800, in 1850, if you borrowed $1,000 from the bank, the bank gave you $1,000. They didn't write you a check. They gave you $1,000. There was the, if, you did, if there was no cash, it didn't count. And the $1,000 was gold and silver certificates that said you can exchange this for $1,000 worth of gold or $1,000 worth of silver. Everything was backed up by metal. We went off the gold standard in 1972 or 73. Nixon took us off the gold standard. Before that, every single dollar in the United States was backed by gold. In theory, I don't, I mean, if you, you have to believe whether or not there was that much gold in Fort Knox. But, Either way, the bottom was conceptually was backed by gold. The currencies, all currencies basically were backed by gold. We went off that. As soon as we went off that, money became meaningless. Now it's just paper. And now it's not even paper because now, like I said, you have electronic transfer. It's just ones and zeros that go from one machine to another. The paper isn't even necessary, right? You do electronic transfer. If you get your uh, paycheck deposit electronically, there's no nothing. Okay, a couple, of, uh, a couple of zeros disappear from one, one machine, go to another machine. That's it. So how, what is the bank doing for you other than hold, they're holding your zeros? So, you, you know, honestly, if you work for a company like GE, and GE should do this, frankly, GE should be like, we'll hold your money. Why should we pay you? GE should just open up a bank for their own employees and say, hey, we're not going to pay you. We're going to hold your money. And when you want it, write a check on your GE account. They should, why, why have a middleman? Why let the banks jump in there? It's like they, they, the amount of money they must pay their employees must be tens of billions of dollars. They should be able to keep it and uh, do something with it. But anyway, so it's all, it's all a fiction and the whole thing is bullshit. That's, <laughs> there's the bottom line. It's all bullshit anyway. And the Fed isn't doing anything other than what the banks want them to do. It doesn't matter what the government wants them to do. It doesn't matter what the people do. It doesn't matter what Yellen testifies to Congress. It's, just a, it's, a, it's a show. They're doing exactly what they want, okay? They're, getting, they're taking your money. They're, they're robbing you. They're taking your money for free. You put your money in the bank. They give you no interest for it. And if you're good, they'll give you back about as much as you put in. That's, that's thievery, not banking. <laughs> well, I've I got to answer questions faster than that, don't I? <laughs> food prices have fallen for nine straight months in the United States. It's the longest street food deflation to the level of uh, BDA. Yeah, we, we already have a DBA play. I do like them. I absolutely... Uh, DBA, DBA, blah, blah, blah. 
Ah, so we could have all my charts. DBA is the Agriculture ETS. I, I like it because if you look at the uh, futures, grains, these are dailies, okay, weekly, everything's low. Same thing. We're, we're in a down spot. We're in, we've been in a downtrend for a while, but you always have downtrends and uptrends. You've had a long, this has been a long downtrend. You see what happened here? Down, 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 and then big spike up. I can't, it doesn't go back further in this, unfortunately. Um, down, down, down. Soybeans, no. Soybean oil. For some reason, soybeans go up and soybean oil goes down. I find that very strange. Uh, soybean meal goes up. So what, what is, <laughs> I, I don't know the mechanics. I, I, I don't know why soybean oil is not Correlating with soybeans, it's very strange. Wheat went way, way down. I, I, in fact, I already called this one. I said wheat at 400. If you, I mean, you have to have special accounts to play these, but if you can play wheat at 400, I love it down here. That's a great price. You really, you know, at 400, you're in the panic area where you're getting below the logical cost of wheat. So that's a good spot for it. Rice also will pick up nicely. So, so this $10 line, which we're below the $10 line on rice. When we're back over the $10 line on rice, that's a good thing to play. Corn is fantastic to play off the 300 line. We talked about that one also, I think, last week. Um, you know, meats, okay, we're, we're back to exporting cattle to, Japan, to China. So if we're exporting more cattle to China, then cattle will get more expensive. Okay, I'm not a big cat. Again, you've got to have special accounts to play these. So cattle with 100, good place to play north. Okay, if it goes below, get out. That's all. So you don't lose much money. We're not exporting hogs. We're exporting cattle. We're exporting beef. And the world is consuming more beef. So you had a big run. You go from 60 to 120 is a 100% run. So even though you went over, that doesn't mean you're going to hold it. 100% is a long way to go. You have a 100% run. How much is the pullback if you went up 60? Your pullback is, one, is, is um, 12, is a weak pullback. So what line is this? this? Is 100. So 12 would be 108. And the next pullback is going to be 12 below that is 96. So a strong retrace is 96. And the problem is people have no patience. These things take years to play out. But when you have a run of, of to 60, you overshoot a little bit. And by the way, how much do we overshoot by? We overshoot the same amount as a strong retrace. We overshoot by 12. So 60 points up, no, I'm sorry, it's a week, I'm sorry, it's a week retrace. The same as a week retrace. 12 is a week retrace, and 132, that's how much we overshoot. Then we come back down to a week pullback at 108. Same 12 points, right? 12 points up, 12 points back. Get rejected back at the 100% line. Now we're going to have a strong retrace. 96 is your target. And then retest. 120 and probably have a proper breakout. But, what, but look at the time frame we're talking about. A year, another year, another year, another year. So, so this year, probably still low. Then next year, or, you know, I'm sorry, this year meaning a year from now, then the next year, probably start to move back up. And then two years, and then three years, so three years from now, we're talking about moving back over the 120 line. So somewhere between two and three years from now, that's the kind of consolidation. Unless there's a big uptick in beef, but I don't see any particular reason that would happen. I, I, it annoys me they don't have chicken. Because to me, chicken substitutes for beef, so you have hogs, beef, and, and you have no idea what chicken is doing. And then the stocks we were looking at before, also the same thing. They're, they're in a trough generally. Coffee's low, sugar's low. All these are parts of DBA. So as these things start picking back up, DBA will pick back up. And, and everything is looking bottomy. So I don't know when. It could take a couple of years. That's the problem. Though. You have to look at the time frame. It could take a couple of years. But DBA is a good play going forward. So you want to, I mean, you want to know what a DBA play should be? If, I was going to, if we're going to play DBA, and we have DBA, I don't know what, in what portfolio. Oh, look at the markets flying up. Holy crap. Somebody said something, right?
DBA. So if you're going to play DBA, you just want to go out long as you can. So at the moment, you can go 2018. <laughs> I always check the number now because I learned my lesson. It's so confusing because she says 19 January 18. And the funny thing is the 2019 say 18 January 19. So it's really because the, the date happens to be the expiration date is the 19th here and on next year is the 18th. Very annoying. Um, so, 20. If you want to play DBA, I don't like selling these puts much. You can sell these puts for a buck, the $20 puts, and I think it's fine for a floor. But frankly, I would rather sell puts in something else to, to pay for it. Um, but on the upside, these are fantastic prices because you can buy the, um, what are these, the 19 calls, right? And they're 220, 222. So for 222, you can buy the 19s. You can sell the 23s. Now I sell the 22s. You can sell the 22s for 80 cents. So 222 minus 80 is about 42. And it's a $3 spread. So you have 100% upside on the spread. And then you sell something for a buck to offset it, and then you've got a net 40 cent entry. And it doesn't matter what you sell. It's anything you think you want to buy for a buck if it gets cheap. So uh, as an example, uh, one of the things we like with Chicago Bridge and Iron has nothing to do with food at all. It doesn't matter. But Chicago Bridge and Iron – oh, see, these go up to 2019. So – Oh, it's coming back. Look at that. It actually went up today. So Chicago Bridge and Iron, we think, has a good floor here. Now, since it's been so weak, let's go look at it for a second. Nope. Nope. There. CBI. Because it's been so weak, hardly weak, scary, right? Because it's been so weak, the price of the puts is heavily inflated. The volatility, the implied volatility of this specific stock is high. That means we get great put prices. That's one of the reasons I keep coming back to them. I like it because I think this is the floor. But you can sell, look at this, you can sell a $25, a $25 well, forget that, so you can sell this $22.50 put, $5 below the current price, 20% below the current price. You can sell a $22.50 put for $3.75. So I can sell five of those for $3.75, which is 1500 1600 bucks, whatever. I can sell five of those, and it pays for, whoops, damn it. So selling five of those for 1600 bucks pays for, on the, um, on the spread, what did we say the spread was net dollar forty, right? So five of those pays for more than 10. I mean, really, you could buy 20 of the, of the, of the spreads on the, um, uh, on DBA. You can buy 20 of those DBA spreads at $3 each. So you can buy $6,000 worth of the DBA spread. And the net cost, if it's $2,800, bucks, less 16 for $1,200, bucks, so at $0.60 cents each. And you've got $6,000 of upside on the 20, uh, and that was on the, um, I forget, was that the 1922 spread, right? So on a $3 spread, all DBA has to do is go to is be a 22. You're going to get $6,000 back, so a 4,500 profit, like about 300% upside profit. And if Chicago Bridge and Iron, all, unless it drops more than 20%, and the only thing that happens if you drop 20% is you have to buy 500 shares of, of uh, Chicago Bridge and Iron. That's like $10,000. So you're, you're promising to buy $10,000 worth of Chicago Bridge and Iron. But, but, you're, but right now, that, that same amount will cost you um, thirteen five. So you're getting a huge, huge discount. That's your worst case scenario is getting to this stock that we think is going to be is very, very cheap for a huge discount. These guys have a lot of cash. They're a good company. So that's how I play DBA. But it doesn't have to be Chicago Bridge and Iron. It should be any stock that you really want to buy if it gets cheaper and it has good pricing on the puts. So Chicago Bridge and Iron, for us, it fills all those uh, check boxes.
Well, yeah, natural gas. That, that's the thing. The hydrogen cars are going to shoot demand for natural gas up like crazy. I was it oil has been popping the market? I didn't look. Holy crap! <laughs> okay, well that's our shorting line. Forty-seven fifty is where we said we want to start shorting. So I'll tell you right now, I want to go short on oil. I don't. I don't care what the headline is. What happened? Let's take a look. Just just for kick. Let's find out what, what's the uh, headline. Does anybody know? Seeking. Uh, let's see. Seeking Alpha. They usually report something like that. Uh, OPEC deal. There you go. The cartel has reached an agreement to freeze production beginning in November, according to a source. They're only freezing production. They're making too much. Ay -yi -yi. All right. Absolutely, we're shorting oil. So as soon as the seminar ends, which should be about a half hour, we are shorting oil, and I will give you a preview. So let's figure out our trade. Um, uh, uh, freezing production at too much. That's like okay, like that's like you go you go to your house and it's on fire, and the fire department goes, okay, we're not going to let the fire get any bigger. We're going to keep the fire that size. <laughs> Don't worry, we're on the case. That is not going to help. Your house will burn down. It will just burn down slower than if the fire gets bigger. It does not help you put the fire out. You have to stop. You, when you're making too much of something, you have to make less of it. Making, continuing to make too much is not going to fix your problem. Wow. I cannot believe that. Freezing production. That's their agreement. That is really shameful. Um, <laughs> and then you've got to assume they're going to stick to it, which they're not going to stick to it anyway. But, you know, you don't know they're not going to stick to it, so you take them at their word for what it's worth. All right. So oil... Uh, we're going to do USO again. We did that last time. So USO in the in the options opportunity portfolio and in the short term portfolio actually USO. Wow, it's only ten seventy seven. Wow. Why is that? USO is not yet reflecting the the rise in oil. Up sixty cents is. 6%. Oil is up. Where are we going? Energy. No, this isn't showing. Oil is up at least 6%. The USO should be quite a bit higher. Not, not quite a bit, but definitely higher. So I think we want to wait. But I, I think on the whole, we're going to want to take something like um, maybe we should hit our lows in October. But these, these are the, what is this? Oh, here we go. So the October 12 puts are 133, 140. This is the same ones we keep taking. Um, this is, oh, actually, this is about the right price. There's no premium here. You see this? If you pay 135, it's at 1070. So you're only paying a nickel of premium for this put. So these $12 puts are, are kind of the way to go. And the idea is they go back down to 2 bucks. So, you know, you're trying to make, you know, make, well, it's not bad, making 60 cents. You're making almost 50% if it drops back down, um, which, which we've done multiple times. So these are still the ones I like. It's $12 puts. October is not bad. Let's see what the November ones cost. A little bit more for November. Not sure that's worth it. Because getting towards Thanksgiving, I expect oil to come back up. It's October when I expect it to dive. But I'm not sure, unfortunately, if we're giving it enough time if it's only 23 days. So I think, I think I'd rather pay the extra money for these. So at 150, not 169, because you see the bid is 147 and the ask is 153. So 150, you can fill these. So the November 12 is at 150, and it's at 1073, you're paying 20 cents in premium. And that's it. I would just buy those puts. And in the op I, I think we'll probably go for like 10 in the options opportunity portfolio. Now, 10 is a starting point. If oil goes higher, we're going to be happy to move to like January or February or something like that 
and get more at a higher strike. Be very happy to do that. I don't mind losing 500 bucks and then spending more money to roll to something cheaper. If it goes straight down for it, then we'll make a quick, you know, 500 bucks and, and be done. And the same thing in the short-term portfolio, except we'll probably do it with like 40 contracts. We'll probably just do a bigger amount. All right, that, that's the way I would play it. I just want to get, because you want to be able to take advantage of a quick move. If you put yourself in like a bull call spread or, or a put spread or something like that, you're, you, you can't get out of it. So when you get a nice move in your favor, you can't really exit. So what's the point of that? You see how fast this stuff zips up and down. But that's, a, that's some crazy moves today. And certainly in the future, oh, in fact, here, I'll show you this. I mean, I, I, I'm quite confident in this. We go to the active trading tab, and we find oil. Here's the dollar. Dollar's down. That's another good reason to short oil, because the dollar's down, and that's helping oil move up. So we move to CL, and hopefully we still need 47.50. Oh, no. Son of a bitch. Ah, I wanted to short it here. Would have made money already. Um, see, that's a, that's this is a problem doing the webinars. <laughs> Damn it! It happens all the time. But now, oil come back down a bit, and if oil keeps going down, not not if oil continues to fall, instead of playing oil, I would play the S and P because obviously the S and P moved up when oil moved up. So if oil goes back down. The S&P has barely gone down yet. But as long as the oil is above that red line, I don't want to make that play. Because obviously, this is, this is the range predicted. This is, remember, this is a resistance one, resistance two. It very rarely, these are called standard deviations. It's very rarely going to go past the standard deviation. So it should pull back to this line. But I don't think this is sustainable. I don't think 47.50 is sustainable for oil. So I'm hoping it goes back up. I don't, even though I think it's going to go down, I hope it goes back up. And we'll see what happens. But that's, that's a dopey reason. Just because they're holding production at the current too much level is not a good reason to uh, rally oil. All the other fundamentals are completely against it. So if oil does start breaking below this line, which is 46.80, then I can't short oil. because I, it, I, I can't short oil because I should have shorted it here, and I don't want to chase it. But I, but I can short the S&P at 2160. And I can short, well, the Russell, well, I could have shorted the Russell at 1250 also. But now you see the, oh, oh, oh see, there it goes. So I'm going to short, I'm going to short the S&P. Screw that. There we go. All right, so we got 120. Now, we have one at 215,950. If I want to short another one, I want to short it here at 6050. So my average is 2160. And by the way, we have an, we're having an open webinar today. This is all it takes to short the futures. There's nothing to it. You put up this little screen. You have, this is the sell side. See, it says sell over there. You, can, you kind of can't see it. Here's the buy side. So if I click on this side, I'm buying. If I click on this side, I'm selling. So right now, I'm short one contract. It's like Amazon. It's like one-click shopping. So my, app, my, my average, my only contract is 21.59.50. I want to be at 21.60. But to do that, I'd have to sell another one here. If it doesn't go to here, I have no interest in selling another one. I want to improve my position when I sell. So the oil spike I'm saying is silly. Below this line, you can short. Below 46.80, you can short and use that line for a stop. But that would be a pretty drastic reversal this quickly. So I think it's more fun to play the S&P here. So you always start off with a small amount, and you work yourself into a bigger amount. It's up. There we go. So now we're below, and 80 was the stop line. Remember? So now we're shorting at 49.77. I'm sorry, 46.77. So now we have one contract short oil, one contract short the S&P. But now with oil, I've got more conviction. I really think oil's going to go down. So even if oil goes back to 47.50, I'm going to stay short at at 46. I'm sorry, at 47.25. If I short another one, my average will be 47. 
So that would be my next action. My next action would be to add another short way up here at 47.25 so my average jumps up to 47. So if oil goes higher, that's what I'll do. Oh, remember I said I wanted to add another short here, but it didn't make it. So, you know, whenever you're in the future, you have to have a plan for what you're going to do next. Now, when oil goes there, I'm going to be down $500 on that contract. At 47.25, at 46.25, my first contract will be down 500. Adding another short won't change that. Oh, here we go. There. Now you see my average is 21.60. So now I have two short 21.60. Adding another contract doesn't change the fact that I've lost money. And now my losses will be double when it goes the way I want. But here, now here's a great example of a discipline. Now I get back to 2160. I'm a little below. Let's see if it stays. I'm going to get out. Oh, what'd you do? Now I'm back to one contract, but what happened? See, I sold that average price NA. Oh, you bastard. Why would you do that to me? Uh, anyway, so I sold because the only reason I added more was to lower my basis. So because I added another contract, because I, because I bought back a contract, I, oh no, what happened? Oh, I accidentally sold two. Oh, my bad. Well, it doesn't matter. I can sell one here. There we go. All right. That was very silly. Because I sold a contract, I dropped my basis to, to I changed my basis to 2160. That was my goal. So now I, have a, now I have a higher place that I'm shorting from and a better average. So now if it goes higher, I can do that again and improve my position again. All right, but I don't really want to if everybody's breaking up. I'm just watching what's going on. But I expect the dollar will hold this line pretty much. And if the dollar bounces back up, it's going to push everything back down. It'll be good. But you understand, so what I did is I, I first got in here at 259.50, uh, I think it was. Then I sold another one at 21.6050. That brought my average to 21.60. Then I got out with a small profit. Now I entered again over here, 25, just because I wanted to stay. I didn't mean to sell the extra one. And now we'll see what happens. So here's my break-even point. You can tell my profit for the day is 12.50 at this spot. And I know you're thinking 12.50 is nothing. It's because I'm just demonstrating this. I wouldn't. Do, I mean, I usually trade 10 contract blocks. Um, now, this oil one, as we said, is going to lose up to $500 when it gets up to here. I'm sorry, when it gets up to $47.25, I will buy another one. I'll be down $500 with two contracts. I really want to, be, I really want to have four contracts at $47.50. So if my two contracts average $47, I have to get all the way up to $48 before I'm going to be happy. And at $48, I'll be down like $1,000, $1,500. But I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think we're really going to go above 47.50. So I have two contracts at 47.25. At I'm sorry, my average will be 47. At 47.50, I'll be down a thousand dollars on those two contracts. But I think that's as far as it'll go. And then we're going to eventually get back down to 45. At 45, I'll make uh, two thousand dollars on each contract. So that's what I'm really aiming for. But meanwhile, I only have the one because I haven't lost enough money to bother doubling down yet. So that's it, though. It's so easy. I mean, trading the future, the actual act of trading the future is not at all difficult. And the great thing about the future is, is you pay like a uh, dollar fifty or three dollars to go in and out of the position. And 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 the and the profits, as you guys can see, the loss in this case, one hundred and fifty bucks in, in minutes. So you have very very low friction costs. It's not like trading options. You have very low friction costs, but you're essentially accomplishing the same thing as you would if you were day trading the S&P. So so why why buy options which are difficult to sell? They've got a big bid ask spread and all that. When here I can actually within within a 0 0.25 I can nail the move on the S&P. That's the benefit of the future. It saves you money from day trading tremendous amounts of money. All right, so my next goal would be to be at 2161. I have to, I have to sell another one at 2175, I think, to hit that goal. Wait, 61. 
Yeah, I think I think up here. So I'm 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 waiting to see if it goes a little bit higher. Here, this means it's selling at this price right now. So if I added mine here, I'll be part of the. Oh, that filled way too fast. And there you go. See how it moved up to twenty one sixty one. So now I have two short at twenty one sixty one. The high for the day is twenty one sixty two fifty basically. I'm not going to get there, and I don't know if I'll, and I don't want to sell more there. I would only sell more twenty one sixty three, so I get up to twenty one sixty two. So now I have two at twenty one sixty one. If I sell two more twenty one sixty three, I'll have four short at twenty one sixty two, where we are right now. So actually, that would be then I would be comfortable with that. That's a good spot for me to be short. And again, what's our premise? My premise is this move didn't make any sense. The dollar is low, so if the dollar goes back up, if oil goes back down, it's going to put pressure on the S&P, and it'll be a nice win. So that's what we're looking at. But we knew it was going to be a crazy day, and it's going to be crazy into the end of the week. So we'll see what happens. Because, you know, the end, because the quarter's ending, and, every, and all the brokers now, you talk about manipulation in the commodities market, the manipulation in the, and the bank rates, the, the commodities are manipulated, the bank, the bank rates are manipulated, and you've got the, um, and, and of course the market itself is manipulated because they, the, the, the uh, fund managers will purposely buy stuff, and they're not buying crap, they're buying, they're buying market moving things like Apple. You know, they're buying things that push the market higher. They're buying Amazon. They're buying headline stocks to push the indexes higher because what happens is if you push the S&P higher at the end of the day, then all the people's IRA money that, pull, that comes in at the end of the month or on Friday or whatever, all that money will come in and buy everything in the S&P on the index at those prices. These guys then get to unload all their stuff at high prices. They're selling all these garbage stocks. You know, so, so if they get stuck, they get stuck with Apple, which isn't terrible, right? They get stuck with Apple. They get stuck with big, big companies they want to own. They're dumping all their small stocks into all the retail people who are forced to buy it through IRAs and 401Ks and only trade index funds. That's why the banks created index funds, so they could screw people. That's the whole purpose of them. <laughs> they, put, they put a basket. They're like, hey, why buy one good stock when you, could buy it, when you can buy all 500 stocks, including Wells Fargo? Like, you can't not buy Wells Fargo. You can't read the paper in your IRA and say, oh, don't buy Wells Fargo. That doesn't work. When you buy a banking index, you're buying Wells Fargo. When you buy the S&P, you're buying Wells Fargo. When you buy a ton of indexes, you're buying Wells Fargo, even though you know you don't want Wells Fargo. It can be 10% of what you're buying. It's a complete scam. It really, it's just an amazing thing that happens. And people, people let it happen just because, you know, you start, because even, you know, I'm talking about it, probably some of you guys are tuning out. It's like, this is, it, it's not exciting. But, but it, the fact of the matter is that you're being ripped off. Okay. Now, see, Ray's confused. Yeah, I was in and out. I heard you saying that. Okay, not today. Long term. Next year. A year from January, we expect natural gas to be at four dollars. In between that, I don't really give a crap what it is. It'll go up and it'll go down. I would love to get in at two sixty. It could go down to two sixty. At two eighty, I'll begin to get in, just like we just began to get in on oil. I'll begin to get in at two at two set at two eighty. I hope to get my average down somewhere around two sixty for a long term long position, and then probably at three, I would get half out again, and then hopefully can take a ride up to four. But, but I'm talking about a ride up to four over the next year. Just look at the market. We think the market's going to correct 10 to 20%. That doesn't mean I'm not going to buy it, though. I want it to correct 10 to 20% so we can get in. Yeah, well, Trump's calling out the Fed and yelling, but... but he doesn't really know. I mean, it's not. He again. It goes, you're, you're missing. The, he's missing the point where he knows, and he's just misdirecting people. It's hard to imagine that Trump doesn't understand how this stuff works. The Fed is not doing anything for Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton. They could give two shits about those guys. The Fed does things for the bankers. 
Janet Yellen is not picking up the phone to see what Donald, what, what Hillary Clinton wants her to do today. She's picking up the phone to see what what um, uh, what's his face, what Lloyd Blankfein and Jamie Dimon want. That's who that's who her phone calls go to. And and all this talking to Congress and everything is just a joke. But you have to play the game. Otherwise, people might start wising up. Why why do we let a cartel of banks set interest rates? And then let those interest rates dictate the entire stock market. What the hell? <laughs> I mean, it's so, it's so ludicrous. Not, not, not just the stock market, though. They're also in charge of how much money you'll have when you retire. They set the rates. They have now decided that people who retire will have no money. You keep, you keep not paying interest, and how can anybody have a retirement fund? Sports on that Dollar Tree, right? No, we don't like Dollar Tree. I don't like those dollar stores. They had a huge amount of trouble. We talked about that in chat extensively. Um, the, all the Dollar Tree stores, they all said the same thing. You know what it is? It's the food stand money. Um, you know, yes, if we have a recession again, and pe when people get poor, that's good for the Dollar Tree. So, like, when we had the big crash in 2008, people went to the Dollar Store because they couldn't afford Walmart. Okay. People right now, there's not a real jobs issue in this country. People have jobs. They don't have great jobs, but they have jobs. They can go to Walmart and buy food. They can go to Target if they want to splurge and buy, and buy stuff. Um, they can go to the supermarket and buy food. They don't need to go to the Dollar Tree store and buy, you know, 45 ramen noodle packs for a buck or whatever they sell there. Um, <laughs> unless they're a college student, of course, in which case that's what you live on. Um, so the Dollar Store... I don't understand why ramen noodle is the cheapest substance on earth. I, I don't get that whole thing. I'm not sure how it's made that it can be sold, like literally sold six packs for a dollar at the dollar store of ramen noodles. And even, even in college, though, it's like he, he was, it, was, well, it was cup of soup back then. That's what ramen, ramen noodles are cup of soup, but now they sell actual ramen noodles. Um, <laughs> for some reason, ramen noodles and macaroni and cheese, and all macaroni and cheese are no longer cheap, though. <clears throat> in college, macaroni and cheese is my go-to food. My kids love mac and cheese. Like I went to the supermarket, I was like, "Are you kidding me? This stuff used to be three boxes for a dollar. Now it's like, you know, now it's like three for five or something like that. It's crazy. I don't know, that I don't understand. I don't understand why noodle, why pasta got so expensive. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> so uh, the bottom line of the dollar store, though, is you have to be really poor to to shop at the dollar store on a regular basis and be a serious, you know, be the kind of customer that they count on. The guy's not, not, not where, like, I used to give my kids five bucks to go to the dollar store. Whenever I'd be, like, in one of those plazas with a dollar store, I would give the kids five bucks each, and they would go to the dollar store, and they'd get five things for five dollars, and they loved it. It was fun. Um, <laughs> it'd be weird to see the kind of stuff they came back with, too. Um, so... So that, but that's not, you know, that doesn't make me their go-to customer. Their go-to customer are the people who actually have to eat at the dollar store and have to buy things at the dollar store and walk out of there with like $40 worth of stuff, you know, from their food stamp money. The problem is we cut the food stamp funding, and that hurt the dollar store tremendously. That's like, it's like basically they cut their customers' funding. So that's, it's, it's, gonna, it's not going to come back quickly, okay? Unless we refund food stamps, good luck. You're, you, they're going to have a hard time getting a new customer. Unless either we refund food stamps or people get too poor again to shop at Walmart. Those are two possibilities. But if neither of those things happens, they, those guys are kind of out of luck. They've got problems. You thought the banks want a higher rate. No, no. The banks want to charge you a higher rate. They don't want to be charged a higher rate. And, 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 and by the way, bank earnings are at record all-time highs. It's, it's bullshit when they tell you banks want higher rates and this and that. Banks are they, all that matters to the bank is the spread between what they're paying the Fed, the prime rate, which is zero essentially. So the spread they pay the Fed versus what they borrow money at versus what they lend at the mortgage. So they're lending at four percent if you buy a house, if you have great credit, and you buy a house. They're lending at four percent, five percent, and they're borrowing at one point five. Let's say realistically, they're borrowing longer term, one point five percent. The spread is 3.5%. That's a huge spread. 
That's all they want to do. They just want to have a spread of interest. They don't care what the rate actually is. In fact, what happens is as rates go up, they immediately get impacted by a higher rate. It's hard for them to pass on the higher rates to the consumers because they pass on the higher rate unless people buy homes and then they don't make as much money anyway. So it's not good for them when rates rise. They make less money while rates rise. Okay, the, the, now, when you get to a certain rate, though, when, when you get to 6%, so right now the spread is from 1.5 to 4 or 5. So let's say the, rate, the spread is 3 to 3.5%, three right? When the rates are 8%, 9%, and the bank might be borrowing for 4%, the spread could be 5%. They like that. So they like a higher spread, but, it, but getting there is, is, a, is a tricky business. But right now, I mean, spreads, spreads are never usually more than 3.5%. Right now, spreads are as high as they ever are, and people are borrowing plenty. In fact, borrowing, if you look at the, the total, not, not so much housing, but everything else, like credit card. Oh, that's the other thing. Don't get People are going massively in debt on their credit card, massive, massive credit card debt right now. Almost at the 2007 highs, consumers are horrifyingly in debt. And those spreads are the bank still getting the same money at 1.5%, but on a credit card they charge you 18, 20%, whatever the hell they're charging. And God forbid you're late, they'll charge you another 10% for that. <laughs> so, so yeah, they're, no, they're thrilled, believe me. <laughs> the bank is saying, oh no, please stop lending us money for, no, for free. Stop, stop getting a 0% interest. <laughs> Please, Fed, stop giving us uh, $60 billion a month for no interest. It's, like, that's, it's so ludicrous. It's, it's what they call crocodile tears, right? They, they're, they're complaining about it just to make you think that they don't love what's going on. <clears throat> oh, what's happening? Oh, oil dropping? Or is that, I'm, it's hard to tell the time frame of these things. No, pretty copacetic. Everything's where we thought it would be. Remember, we won't... To what, we want 163 before I want to add any here. And here, nah, you know, like, like I said, up, up close to 47.25, so not happening. Now, where were we? Trump, Fed, um, NQ. Where were we? I remember we were talking about the dollar store at some point. Wow, this is so hard to navigate. Actually, you know why? It's a, it's a, we have extra people here today, so it's like a, a lot more questions and it keeps bopping around. I remember that one. Oh, I don't know. Oh, here we go, dollar. I knew it. Thanks, hi, right, there you go. RB148, um, do you feel pullback after September 30th? I, I think it's being artificially held up right now, and I think, yeah, yeah I do think early October, I think, I, I think we'll go down, but you know what, I've been wrong since July, so we'll see. It never seems to actually go down, but I, I really think that this is a big push to hold things up to the end of the quarter. What, what kind of pullback? At least 5%, hope, uh, at least 5%, hopefully 10% would be a good, healthy pullback. And, and possibly 20% if there's a panic. But I don't think there'll be a panic unless the Fed surprisingly raises it, you know, in the pre-election thing. If they raise for some reason, that would freak people out. If Trump gets elected, people will freak out, 20% drop. And then in December, when the Fed does raise rates, you know, maybe, maybe more than 10% drop then. So, so somewhere between, I really, think, I really think 10, I'd be very surprised if it's only 5. If it's only 5, it's a big sign of strength that we pull back. Um, but, but so I think more like 10 to 20% drop, 10 being the most likely, 20 being only something panicky freaks people out. Um, Blackberry flying us, we just talked about them, it's, it's still not a company I'd be running into. They don't make any money. I, I, I don't get why people just because, just because somebody says they have a plan doesn't mean the plan's going to work. Does the end of quarter move continue all week? Well, it, it continues until the end of the quarter. So yeah, it's gonna, you know, they're gonna try to hold the stocks up until the end of the quarter because the the, the, the brokers, the, all the people, all the people who trade stocks for a living, right? Hedge fund managers, um, the 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 you know, the mutual fund manager, every everybody who takes your money and trades stocks. What do they want? They want to report to you that the market's great and you should put more money in. 
or not take money out in the very least, right? They, that's all they want to do. They can't do that if the market's crashing. It's hard to convince you in their quarterly reports to, to convince you that you should keep more money in or put, or, and put more money in or keep your money in. If you get nervous, you pull your money out. If you pull your money out, they make less money. So the difference, as you see from Wells Fargo, right, the pressure at every level of all of these companies with the traders, the managers, the presidents, everybody, the pressure is to keep the market high and get a good end of quarter. Nobody wants a bad end of quarter. Bad end of quarter means you pull your money out, you pull your money out, people get fired. And you know what these investment banks are like, right? As soon as, as, soon as anything slows down, they cut staff right away. People's jobs hang on the line. People's hundred thousand plus dollar jobs hang on the line of making sure you see a good end of quarter. So although the company like Wells Fargo, although they don't explicitly say cheat and lie and do whatever it takes to keep your job, that's what happens. Every trick in the book they will pull. And they do it all the time. It happens it happens every end of every, End of month, but especially end of quarters. This is what kind of happened. This is what happened. Oil is already dropping. What about RV? Uh, cutting production by 750. Oh, they're cutting production. Oh, that's good. That's ah, I might be in trouble with. Production freeze, 32.5 million barrels a day. It's still, you know, again, uh, you know, not to not to negate it. Cutting production is what they need to do. So 32.5 is compared to what is the question? 32.5 from the current production of 30. Oh, okay, 33.24. There you go. Two OPEC sources told Reuters, "What do you think will happen to DB in the end?" Oh, Deutsche Bank. Um, I think that Lehman and uh, Bear Stearns went under because because the government. And the Fed did not believe it could really happen. They weren't. I mean, they realized it was happening while it was happening. You read the whole. Um, but there was a good. Um, there was a good uh, movie about that at the time. I forget what it was called. Uh, and a book. Um, but at the time, they couldn't believe it could happen. Okay, it's like. Um, it's like Coke going out of business, right? You can't, you know, Coke, if tomorrow, you can't, if you come in tomorrow and they say Coke's in trouble, I think they're going to go out of business. You'd be like, what are you talking about? It's Coke. Right? It's like real obvious to you. Like, How's kind of Coke going to go out of business? It's Coke. You don't need a lot of logic. It's, you're just like, it's freaking Coke. They're not going out of, you know, unless like they poison people, they're not going out of, even if they do poison people, they're not going out of business. But unless something horrifying like that happens, how is Coke going to go out of business? You can't even imagine. All right. So the same thing with Lehman and Bear Stearns. They've been around forever. They were gigantic. Even the people in charge of them, even the regulators, they just couldn't believe that it wasn't a survivable event until the last week. Until it was until it, until their backs were against the wall, and 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 the heads of the banks, or the heads of the head of Lehman, was like, "We are going to go bust." And people like this, and even the, the people who are telling it to us, like, they're like, oh, come on, you're exaggerating. Don't give me that good and loan crap, you just want some money. It's like, no, we're really going to go bust. No, you just want some money. It's like, no, it turned out he actually was going to go bust. Um, so even after that happened, then Bear Stearns is the same thing. And in fact, Kramer, there's a really good thing of Kramer saying how Bear Stearns is a buy, and everybody's being stupid, and Bear Stearns is not like Lehman, and blah, 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 and boom, then Bear Stearns goes bust. And then AIG goes bust. And then, you know, it's like, it like dominoes. And nobody saw it coming even after the next one and the next one and the next one. They still didn't see the next one coming. Even though they were all, they were all doing the same scam and the same mortgages and the same crap. They were, all, they were all in the same boat. didn't matter. You just can't believe. It's like, it's like in the Titanic. It's like, okay, the people in the front of the boat drown and the people in the middle of the boat drown. And now the people in the back of the boat go, well, yeah, they're going to be fine. It's like, no, they're going to drown like everybody else drowned. It's like the boat went under. It just went under front first, so the front people drowned first. But, but everybody drowned. So now, that was then. This is now. Now we all know banks can fail. We all know how catastrophic it is to let them fail. We all know what it does to the global economy and, of course, obviously our national economy. So it is highly unlikely. And I only say highly unlikely because the debt 
of government stupidity are immeasurable. You would think that no one would ever let this happen again because of the repercussions, because of the damage outweighs the aid you give, because it was so clearly obvious that it would have been better to give Bear Stearns a trillion dollars, not that they needed that much, but whatever, but it would be better to give them a trillion dollars then than to spend $10 trillion after the fact cleaning up the mess that was caused by Bear Stearns and, and then Lehman going under. We just handed them the money. How much do you need? Oh, we need $200 billion. Oh, here you go. $200 billion. Check. Okay, easiest thing in the world. They could have, they could have stopped it right there. In fact, the, the TARP, the first TARP was voted down by Congress, right? I couldn't believe it at the time. Because I, I thought it was, it was, that was a great day. Actually, we were doing a play-by-play -play when that happened. <laughs> they voted it down. And I was like, we're doomed. I'm like, how could they vote that down? It was so absolutely necessary at the time. And Congress voted against it. And I don't know if you guys remember, that was the day all the bankers, all the, all, the, all the heads of the bankers had gone to a meeting with the Congress people that afternoon and had sat there at a table with Congress people in the Senate and said, you, you have to do this. You have to vote for this bill. You have to bail out the banks. You have to pass this tarp. Otherwise, we're going to go bust. And Paulson's in there. You have to do it. And the president was there. Bush was there then too. You have to do it. Everybody was saying, you have to do it. They freaking voted it down. Along party lines, of course. You know, Republicans voted it down. Um, the Democrats were like, yeah, bail them out, <laughs> obviously. Um, <laughs> they voted it down. And, and even, uh, what's his face, um, uh, Boehner, even Boehner at the time, he was trying to, he couldn't believe it. He could have lost control of his own party. Um, you know, he knew it had to be done, and it, and it just wasn't done the first time. Then the second time they learned their lesson, 1,000, 2,000 points of the Dow dropping later. They figured it out. They're like, oh, I guess we've got to do this. You know, when they go home and they find their own portfolio to down 20%, the Congress, the, the Congress people finally go, oh, you know what, that was a bad idea. We shouldn't have done that. So can people be that stupid twice? Yes. Obviously, the average senator or congressman is that stupid. Uh, so as much as we who follow the market and are fairly intelligent about it, as much as we say that's never going to happen, you can't do that because you, we're not the ones making the decision. The people making the decision are idiots. So the answer to Deutsche Bank is can they go bust? What will happen to Deutsche Bank? In any logical uh, going forward, looking ahead, they have to be bailed out. Germany has to bail them out. If they don't bail them out, we're back to the same freaking catastrophe we just had. And I, it's hard to imagine. Deutsche Bank has $2 trillion under management. Even if, even if there's just a, a mild disruption, and there won't be, it will be a horrifying disruption, and all that money gets locked up and, and can't be moved, and all these deals unwind and so on and so forth, the repercussions will be global and disastrous. And, and, and for Germany especially. They're, 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 I think they're the largest employer in Germany. Um, I, it's unbelievable that they could even consider it, but so far Germany is saying we're not bailing them out. So, <laughs> I mean, I mean, it would be nice to teach them a lesson, but <laughs> it's a tough lesson to learn right now. But we are talking about the austerity. Yeah, I, I understand. You're talking about the austerity training of the Germans. They might talk. Oh, look, I, again, I know they're going to talk a good game. But in the end, how could they not bail them out? It would be crazy. They will have, it will not, it will, you know, Deutsche Bank will go bust. People won't be able to get their money out of Deutsche Bank. Everybody's going to run to their banks to get their money out. They'll find out there is no money. Right? You know that, that scene from um, It's a Wonderful Life, right? You go to the, everybody runs, it's, 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 that's what a bank run is. It's what a bank run has always been. And it's no different now. You go to Deutsche Bank and you ask your money, okay, Deutsche Bank will be closed. Because they go to something, because they're going under. Deutsche Bank will close their doors. You won't be able to get money out of your machines. So people who put their life savings in Deutsche Bank will have their life savings frozen for time. It doesn't take long before people panic. So then, if, if you're in Commerce Bank and you've got your life savings in Commerce Bank, you're going to go take at least some of it out, right? If you if you hear if, you know if, you know if we hear that Citibank goes bust and all, and our friends who bank at Citibank can't get their money. We're going to go to Bank America and take at least a, I'm going to take a month's worth of money 
just in case. You know, I, I, as long as it's a month's worth of money. My kid, I say, even if I'm optimistic and I think the government can fix everything, I want a month's worth of money. But you can't do that. You can't, you can't have a whole bunch of people take a month's worth of money out of the bank. They don't have it. It's loaned out. That's what Jimmy Stewart's trying to explain to people, and it's a wonderful life. Like, I don't have your money. Your money's in his house and his house and his house. That's what he's saying. He's telling the people, he's like, I don't have your money here. Your money was loaned out to this guy and this guy and this guy. He goes, he goes you don't want me to make him pay me back so I can pay you. And the other person who's saying, like, yes, I do. He's like, I don't give a shit. Give me my money. Okay, there's no Jimmy Stewart speech going to go on here. Okay, people, people just want their money, and they will freak out. And that will force another bank to close their doors and say, we can't give you your money, we don't have it. Then another bank, and another bank, and another bank, and it all starts falling apart very quickly. You can't, you can't let it happen. Because like I said before, the whole monetary system is complete bullshit, and it's only based on the faith that people have in the fact that the dollar means something. A dollar is nothing but a trading instrument, and it's a trading instrument that has an agreed-upon value, and that value is discovered through a trading process where you trade the dollar for goods and services, and people trade the dollar for labor, and it's all traded, and X amount of dollars gets you X amount of goods and services and X amount of labor. And that's how you arrive at the value of a dollar. There's no actual value to the dollar. It's just the agreed-upon tradable value of it. You know, and, and, and if it all collapses, it, then, you know, as soon as, soon as, as soon as it really collapses, like you go to the Gilligan's Island model, right? And, uh, and, and, uh, and that guy, the Thurston Howe, right, the, uh, the rich guy on Gilligan's, on Gilligan's Island, he's like burning dollar bills to start, burning like hundred dollar bills to start a fire. He's got suitcases full of money. God knows why he had the suitcases full of money. But he's got suitcases full of money. He tries to get people on the island to do things for money. They, they're like, why would I do for money? Nobody has money. You can't buy anything on the island. They're the only ones here. That's what happens. You start, you, you know, as soon as, you're, as soon as you're out of that system and you actually have to do things, you know, the, the money becomes immediately worthless. Once you lose faith in money, it's worthless. It's just freaking paper with stuff written on it. Money doesn't get you a coconut. You know, money doesn't get you, money doesn't, be, money doesn't buy you food. Money doesn't get you clothes. Nobody's going to make clothes. You know, if, if, if everything falls apart and you can't, and you can't trust the banks, then what, what's the point of money if you can't trust the banks anyway? Then it's all just about doing work in exchange for the thing that you want. Money is what we, what we use in society to make those, those exchanges worthwhile. So I don't want to go directly to work for the grocery store for four hours to get my food for the week. You know, that, that, I don't want to go to the car dealership and put in like a month of my time at the car dealership to get my car. So instead, we exchange this money back and forth so that we agree that all these goods and services can be traded for this much money. But that's all money is. So, yeah, the whole thing can collapse in a puff of smoke because it is smoke. It's all smoke and mirrors. And with that happy note... <laughs> <laughs> we'll close on the summer so they better bail out Deutsche Bank. Put it that way. If they don't bail out Deutsche Bank, we're, you get your money out. You'd be the first one at the door to get your money out because it's going to be uh, exactly like it was in 2008. It's going to go fast and furious. But it's, not, it, it's so unacceptable, I can't imagine it's going to happen. But again, you must have hedges. You must, must, must have hedges. All of our portfolios have hedges. You cannot leave your money in stocks if you don't have hedges to the downside. That is the most important thing. And if we survive into next week, we should talk about that. So, so remind me next week's webinar, we'll talk about hedges, and we'll go over our portfolio hedges. Very important. In fact, well, let's start. Right, before we close out, let's take a look at our portfolios. Ah. See where they stand at the moment. Okay, here's our short-term portfolio. And it's up 375. The short-term portfolio is going nowhere. Now, this is where our main hedges are. Our main hedges are the SQQs and um, TZA. We have a lot of TZA. That's short on. That's ultra short on the Russells. So we have that spread for TZA. We have this spread for SQQ. Um, like I said, we have these Amazon shorts, which are not working out. We have the Tesla shorts, which are okay so far. That's why we're not gaining because these Amazon shorts are hitting us for a, a $6,000 loss at the moment. 
Um, otherwise, we're fine. And, oh, and, and fast, and we're short on the financials. That's another one, which is obviously not good today. But in general, we have this nice short on the financials. It's doing well. It doesn't look like it's doing well, but we already cashed out $100,000 on the long side. So this is just this is just gets subtracted from the 100000 we cashed out. Um, here's our copy play. We like that. Anyway, so not to go over everything. So short-term portfolio is basically flat from, from the last review. The options opportunity portfolio is up about mm, almost 10% almost since our last review a couple of weeks ago. So that's doing fine, and, and that has a good mix. And again, hedges, SQQ, TZA, these are our hedges in case things fall apart. SJB is junk bonds, if, if junk bonds fall apart. In fact, these went up $0.08 cents today. That, that, came, that was 30 this morning, went up to 38 already. Uh, TLT is another short, which is just about even right now. We like that one. And these are our longs, basically. Let's see. We have the, uh, the long-term portfolio. That's got to be, that was up 120. Let's see how it is. 122. It's even up more. Wow. Um, <clears throat> so the long-term portfolio is up a ridiculous 122. These are our long-term, long positions. So you know it's just a thermometer. It's just like we're checking the health of the thing. So this is going up while the short-term portfolio is flat. No worries. That's exactly that's fine. We don't need the short-term portfolio to go up if the long-term portfolio is going up because the long-term portfolio has a half a million dollars. Well, a million now, but the long-term portfolio had a half a million dollars in it. The short-term portfolio started out with a hundred thousand dollars. So now it's now it's over a million. So this one going up two percent is way better than the, than the short-term portfolio dropping five percent. And then last of all, the butterfly portfolio, 185. Oh, 188. Okay. <laughs> so this one is steady as a rock because every position in it is self-hedging. Now, we cheat a little bit. We have a few that aren't quite hedged the same way as others. But in general, there are just a bunch of self-hedged positions that uh, essentially we're either off-target or on-target for our things. Plus, we sell a boatload of premium, so we're always collecting money. Every day, that this, every day that we're not grossly outside of our range, we're making money. And that's what we love about this portfolio. <clears throat> anyway, so balance and hedging. And if you're not hedged, talk with me about it in chat. Okay? Everybody should have hedges. Everybody's got to be protecting the positions they have because this market could unravel very, very quickly. Okay? Especially next week, very dangerous time. Did I miss anything here? No, no, no. Oh, look at that. Where are we? What? I'm short at 46.77, and we're at 46.83. Okay, I can accept that. So this one is still the same place we left it, but now we have two. And don't forget, this is the highest spot that we started with. This one, like I said, until it's 47.25, I have no interest in adding. All right, and frankly, now that, now that you've told me that they are going to cut, I'm not as enthusiastic about this trade, so I'm probably just going to sit there and watch this one. I'm not enthusiastic about adding to this until I see it settling down. Okay, because the fact is in the, it's, it's not what we thought at first. We thought it was just a freeze. It's not just a freeze. There is a cut. The cut is not big and it's not meaningful, but that doesn't mean that it won't pop oil higher first before it goes back down. All right, so we'll leave it at that. We'll see what happens next week. And uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. I'm sorry about the technical difficulties. I mean, hopefully I'll, I'll double-check and triple-check the computer next time, make sure we don't have it again next week. All right, thanks, guys. Have a great day.